good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my very, very great pleasure to have been asked about three minutes ago <laughs> to introduce uh, Lord Christopher Monckton to this group. This is going to be something very unusual for you. It's not very often that you find yourself in an entirely friendly environment. Um, some months ago, uh, Christopher, in one of our Saturday morning uh, sessions, told me that uh, he was thinking of inviting uh, Lord Monckton to give the Nuremberg Lecture. And I immediately said to him, oh, Chris, Chris, please, can we, can we at the same time try and arrange an uh, International Free Press Society Canada event with him? And uh, after many tractations over a long period of time, I'm really, really happy to welcome you all to hear uh, Lord Moncton speak. Uh, many of you have seen his videos, and uh, none of us who've met him have been disappointed. And I'd just like to tell you a small anecdote. Uh, in two, th I think it was, when, when was it? Two, I guess it was 2008 or 2007, Lord Moncton wrote a piece which he sent to uh, John McCain, and I think pleading with him to please abandon the global warming train and the disastrous economic and other policies that would follow from it. And I read this in the American Thinker and pressed the reply button and sent a little message to him saying, why don't you send this to the British members of parliament? They seem to need it even more than the Americans do. To which, I hope you won't mind me recounting this, he wrote back and said, they can't read. <laughs> <laughs> and on this note, I will ask you to come and speak. <laughs> My lord, that's me, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> After that amazingly disconcerting but unduly flattering introduction, I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> a prostitute, a politician and an engineer were in a bar together discussing which of theirs was the oldest profession. The prostitute said that hers was known to be. The engineer said that God created order out of chaos and that was an engineering feat. And the politician, wearing a, a, a Viscount's coronet and an old Herovian tie, said, and who do you think it was that made the chaos? <laughs> so I'm now here to introduce a note of chaos into these <laughs> proceedings by suggesting that just because we are told there is a consensus about stuff doesn't mean there is one. And if you go back 2,300 years, uh, you're all too young to remember, but at that time <laughs> Aristotle first wrote down the dozen commonest fallacies in human discourse, logical fallacies. And not the least among these was that fallacy which the medieval schoolmen would later characterize as the argumentum ad populum, the head count fallacy. You can't determine whether or not a proposition is true at all merely because a lot of people are said to believe that it is true. Whether or not there's a consensus about something tells you nothing about whether or not it's true. And yet today, we are told by the environmentalists, they used to call themselves Marxists, but it sounds so much cuddlier to be environmentalists, that uh, just as they were so certain of their ghastly political system before, so they're now certain of exactly the same ghastly political system now. It's been rebranded and tidied up for the 21st century, but it's the same brand, insisting that only it knows what is best for us and it is our duty to knuckle under and obey what they call the consensus and which we would call the party line. Now, if you look, for instance, 
at what is about to happen, which is the Agenda 21 conference at Rio de Janeiro on the 20th anniversary of the Earth Summit, which launched the whole ghastly process of the global warming scare and the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Now they're having a big self-congratulatory jamboree, as usual, down in a nice exotic location with beaches and dancing girls and grass skirts and all the other accoutrements that uh, no scientist these days can be seen without. <laughs> there they will be, and they will be deciding, uh, as they have been trying to decide for the last 20 years, that what we need to do is to shut down the West. That's how you can tell that this is essentially the communist agenda all over again. The communists of old would always start by trying to attack the soft underbelly of the West, which is, of course, our energy supply. They organised the miners' trade union in the United Kingdom. They trained Arthur Scargill first at the Patrice Lumumba University of Terrorism in Moscow, and then when they realised he was a cut above the rest, transferred him to the Lenin Institute, where the top terrorists from all around the world, the Yasser Asaf Arafat, the Jerry Adamses, they were all trained there. And then he came back to the UK and began making trouble. It was they who founded, funded and animated the campaign for nuclear disarmament, which was nothing to do with nuclear weapons really. It was to try and turn us off the idea of developing the peaceful uses of nuclear power. So that with the unions having prevented us to using our coal for fossil fuel, they would then also shut down the possibility of developing nuclear power and we would simply run out of energy and be reduced to exactly the same collapsed economic state which they had so gloriously already achieved. <laughs> now this battle, even though the Soviet communism has now gone and good riddance, is still being fought by those whom they planted in the West to fight it. Nobody seems to have told them that hello, communism has gone. You now have the same type of people, using the same type of rhetoric, but no longer carrying the baggage of the failed Soviet system. Now, under its rebranding, they're saying, we need to pursue what the UN, in its Agenda 21 document, calls the sustainability agenda. And this new buzzword, sustainability, means you can't do anything if something might run out when you do it. That's it in a nutshell. Now, since we live on a planet from which few of us will have any chance permanently of escaping, because the well of gravity is still too deep for us to claw our way out with any facility, we are dealing with resources, all of which are to some degree or another finite. Everything is running out, including sunlight. This just in. In four and a half billion years, the sun will burn itself out. So, no more sunbathing, because you're running us out of sunlight. <coughs> and they say that we're going to experience peak oil, peak fossil fuels, and everything from there on will be downhill. The fact that this is not true, and will not be true for hundreds or even thousands of years, does not matter. The fact is, we have to fossilise everything, as if they hate fossil fuels so much, this idea of fossilising everything in its place is very strange, but that's what they want. They want no change. They are, in fact, the new Conservatives. They want everything to be as it has always been. Go back to those lovely pictures of rustic Europe painted by the great Dutch masters, with men toiling up and down the fields, with pitchforks and building haystacks and, and uh, harvesting by hand. And it's all a very nice rural myth. But just imagine how many people would have to die in order to bring about that myth of sustainable development. And let's start with the number of people who are dying already because of the myth of sustainable development. If we go back this time to within the lifetime of some of us, the 1960s, when the ban on DDT came in, this was done in the name of sustainability. 
preserving the environment from the terrible wanton destruction that the release of DDT therein would inevitably cause. Now, of course, this was based, as all these scares are, on bogus science. But they succeeded in the left capturing this issue. They shut down all use of DDT worldwide. And DDT, at the point when they did this, was just about to eradicate malaria altogether. Malaria was on its way out everywhere. Deaths worldwide had fallen to 50,000 a year. Bad enough, goodness knows. But a lot less bad than they had been. When, for instance, most of North America was malarial in the, la in the 19th century. It isn't now because DDT was widely used and eradicated it. That could and should and would have happened everywhere else in the world had it not been for one book by one well-meaning but dopey scientist who got her science wrong, Rachel Carson. And she wrote The Silent Spring. And notice this was not a scientific title published in a peer-reviewed journal. It was an emotive title. And here began the process of emotionalising and making cuddly the killing of tens of millions of people. No longer would you have the jackbooted Nazis walking across the landscape as the Jews were slaughtered. Now you would have children slaughtered, a massacre of the innocents, the like of which, innocents, the like of which has never been seen. But this would somehow be all right because even if the children were dying, they were dying in the good cause of saving the planet. And what happened? From 50,000 deaths by malaria, before the ban came in, within five years, the deaths from malaria had rocketed again to a million a year. And they have stayed at somewhere around a million a year ever since. In fact, last year, one and a quarter million deaths. And yet, on September the 15th, 2006, Dr. Arata Kochi, the head of the UN's malaria program, announced that he would lift the malaria ban, the DDT ban. He said, in this field, science usually comes second and politics first. We will now take a stand on the science and the data. And he lifted the ban on DDT, and announced that in future it would be once again the front line of defence against the mosquito. And what happened? Nothing happened. Children are the ones that malaria kills, so they continue to die a million plus every year because the left want them to. Because the left, for all the talk of caring, do not care about the little ones of our own species. And so there is your first clue as to what this sustainability agenda is all about. It is a ruthless depopulation agenda. The view is that there are too many of us on the planet and that unless something is done there will be too many more, all our fellow species will one by one be wiped out and this would be bad news. So what is the truth? The truth which you will not hear spoken at Rio. The truth is quite different, as any demographer will tell you. If you have a population that is poor, it will tend to breed faster than a population that is rich. So if you keep a population poor, or by various policies, including those intended to improve so-called sustainability, you make a rich population poorer again, then you will increase the birth rate. If, on the other hand, you want to stabilise the birth rate of humankind, particularly in the poorer countries where the birth rate is greatest,